Good afternoon. I'm Sister Marie Nicoletto, and in name of the Rudloff family and extended family, thank you for coming today to grieve as a community and to celebrate Tom's life as a community. Thank you so much. From my vantage point, Tom was a Renaissance man. He could quote the classics and the scripture with the same range of knowledge and enthusiasm. Tom was a man very present to all of life. John Shea described a person of great spirit as one who welcomed all to his table. In regard to Tom, this surely means the table of his hospitality and of his heart. Tom had a quality of presence that many longed to have for themselves. Tom spoke and read several languages, French, Italian, Greek, Latin, German, the language that most people heard Tom speak was that of kindness and compassion. A family member named the scripture of the Good Samaritan as most descriptive of Tom's life's journey. As Tom journeyed fully alive and aware, he often stopped, listened, cared for, encouraged, and nourished those he met along the way. Surely Tom is missed. I would like to invite uh, Sister Mary Geringer, who is a servant of Mary and a friend of the family. She's been invited to share one of Tom's very favorite hymns. Thank 
you, sister. Hello. My name is Eric Christensen, and I've known Tom literally my entire life. As some of you, I'm sure, sick of hearing by now, uh, I was born in 1970, the first year that the antiquarium was open, and my parents uh, carried me in as a baby, and uh, that led to a lifetime of a lifetime love of uh, learning and literature. And Tom quickly became one of the most important people in my life and one of my favorite people in my life. And what I'd like to do today is to read two short passages by Bertrand Russell, a philosopher and writer who Tom loved. I, I think these passages are tied together with a common theme. The first is from a piece from 1925 called What I Believe. And it goes... There have been at different times and among different people many varying conceptions of the good life. On such a matter, no argument is possible. I cannot, therefore, prove that my view of the good life is right. I can only state my view and hope that as many as possible will agree. My view is this. The good life is one inspired by love and guided by knowledge. Knowledge and love are both indefinitely extensible. Therefore, however good a life may be, a better life can be imagined. Neither love without knowledge nor knowledge without love can produce a good life. And the second passage is from an interview Russell did years later in 1959. And in it he says, I should like to say two things, one intellectual and one moral. The, the intellectual thing I should want to say is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you wish to believe or by, by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed. But look only and solely at the facts. That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say is very simple. I should say, love is wise, hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. And if we are to live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity and a kind of tolerance which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet. I think that by Russell's definition of the good life, inspired by love and guided by knowledge, Tom Rudloff lived the best of all possible lives. He was on a good-natured and gentle, yet ravenous search for knowledge, and he showed an immense love to those who were lucky enough to meet him along that search. Hello, I'm uh, Isaiah Ramsey, Tom's great nephew. Maya Angelou once wrote, one paints the beginning of a certain end, the other the end of a sure beginning. His journey begins on a path with ribbons of twisting roads. Its sinuous course is paved with his past, present, and future. He will travel for an eternity. He will walk miles before he sleeps. And yet his journey will never be long enough. Sometimes his road will feel obscured and lonely, but he will never be lost and he will never be alone. He will discover more magical purpose as he holds steadfast to the future. Other times his journey will be filled with glorious and joyful moments. This will renew his strength to start anew. What will his destination be? His destination will be unknown. He will eagerly ascend upon his journey with a dream. He walks with a belief in what is real. 
He walks with a trust, a trust despite doubt. He walks with inspiration to be who you are. He walks to seek knowledge. He walks to seek love. As the path he travels is narrowed and winding roads are straightened, the world weeps that his journey has ended too soon. Did he make it to his destination? No, because he will travel forever. We will have comfort being aware that his voyage fulfilled his dreams, attained his knowledge, and showed him love. As Bertrand Russell once said, this has been my life. I have found it worth living and would gladly live it again if the chance were offered me. I've known Tom Rindloff since I was about 15, and uh, we started out as tennis partners, and we ended up uh, sitting down, I, I write poetry, and and uh, this, this is the last piece he helped me with. It's entitled, It Comes to Rust. To rust is where all goes. For rust is, in itself, complete and overwhelming. Within rust, the wisdom of nature and the color of nature. For rust knows from whence it comes, and rust knows to where it shall go. All are new and strong, once in time, invincible, powerful, and cunning. But time waits, laughingly and patient, until rain and shine, dust and grime, have descended, laying waste to all that is new and strong. Away goes youth's strength, dim the shine will become, until all that remains is rust. But rust knows from whence it comes, and rust has won, for within rust is the wealth of time, of dust and grime. I'm Leslie Cavanaugh, and my husband Jim and I have been friends with Tom's for decades. And Jim would be here but for Delta Airlines, and I'm sure he'll start walking in just as soon as I start these remarks. But I speak from both of us. Tom was the big brother that we wished we all had. Erudite, generous, kind, patient, wry. If he found out that you spoke French, the next time he saw you, he'd greet you with a tossed off paragraph in French, beautiful diction, complete with a pun. He could tell puns in five different languages. <laughs> Seven. And your slow brain would get about half of it. <laughs> It wasn't showing off for him. I want you to understand that. He just genuinely loved language, wanted to share it with you. And my reaction was, oh, crap. <laughs> I need to go study my French some more. And I did. He would do that. He would, through his gentle conversation, prod you into being better than yourself, smarter. He sparked you into wanting to know more, much more. Here was a book. Here was knowledge. Here was his gentle hand. Here, I pass this on to you. He was our Alexandria, the holder of vast stores of knowledge the tutor, advisor, seminar leader, salon host, sponsor, patron. His breathtaking memory for history, philosophy, theology, language, literature, led him to be a guide for a host of hungry minds. I once shared with him that I was interested in linguistics. 
and he poked around in the back of the shelves and came out with three books. One, he assured me, was much too dense, but there, but there was still some good stuff in it, and two, which were maybe approachable. Go and read them, and we'd come back and talk. Tom was like that. I had in my hand, with these three books and the opportunity to talk to Tom, a graduate seminar. If I was brave enough. Tom made you brave. Learn more, it's never too late. My husband Jim said to me the other night after learning of Tom's passing, I don't know who else I'm going to talk to about this stuff. Gnosticism, Plato, Lucretius. Who else could keep all those different balls in the air during a conversation and say, yes, but, and pull out that unifying theory behind someone's ear? Who will we talk to? He was our landlord, Jim and I, when we needed a spot. And at any one time, there were always someone living somewhere in the vast interior upstairs <laughs> and the catacombs down below. Sometimes more than a few. Some for years on end. He was the landlord for Obama. It's true. He was the first headquarters at the Antiquarium. It hosted the one and only fundraiser for any chambers. But that marked a long line of activities and advocacies that emanated from his place. It wasn't the place. People keep talking about the place. It was Tom. Because of Tom and his shop, there was a place to go if you thought different, talked different, <coughs> felt different, loved different. You could meet anyone at Tom's place, from Allen Ginsberg to Kent Bellows, judges, cops, undocumented immigrants. My husband said you could buy anything from the Baltimore Catechism to Nick Cherbury's latest nude art photos. <laughs> Jim noted you could smoke, drink, cook your own supper at his place, or share his. You could get your mail delivered there, pick up your social security check, go to an MA meeting, or play piano upstairs. Tom made his place the first safe place for LGBT meetings. It was the venue that launched a thousand bands. Dave St. Fault founded his business there and offered vintage final and revisionist Omaha history in equal measure. The book business was incidental, not integral. If there was an important discussion going on in the front of the shop, regarding a disputation regarding German grammar or a point of Greek philosophy, God help the poor, ignorant soul who interrupted to sully that moment with an attempt to buy a book. <laughs> now, once he was engaged in transactional business, you could haggle on the price but you better know what you were talking about. <laughs> For Jim, he created special sections on Jim's passions, Stalinist Russia, medieval Ireland, and let him buy her credit. Here is a book. Here is knowledge. Here is his gentle hand. Here, I pass this on to you. I loved him. Jim loved him. Our children, Aileen and Seamus, loved him. And he loved us back in bounteous return. As Jim said, he was the most gentle, loving man he ever knew. He made Jim into Seamus long before we named our son Seamus, or he was even a glimmer in our eye. He showered our children with gifts of books, delighted in their, his conversation. His face lit up when he was engaged with kids. His delight was genuine, and he talked to them not like they were children, but like very small people who were just height challenged. <laughs> there were long-ranging Scrabble games, croquet tournaments, and silly stories. He loved to play. He was the big brother we all wished we had. He once mentioned that Freud said, a good life had work, play, and love. 
His life was a blend of all. His antiquarian monastery gave him the perfect place to do the work he loved, which was to play with all of us, sell the odd book, and share the genius that was his unique gift. When he found the Brownville School, and with the help, guidance, and encouragement of Randall and Jane Smith, and the Brownville community, he made a new antiquarium and truly came home. He built a real monastery, and he was its true abbot, in the world but not of it. Happy as the proverbial clam. All the world came to visit, and he found new friends too. He served Sunday brunch on board the uh, Riverboat Inn with a dignity suited to an old world waiter. Played chess with the young and the gray and cajoled all comers into books, music, and the odd map or poster. Here is a book. Here is knowledge. Here is his gentle hand. Here. I pass this on to you. Let me read from Jim's note to me. We spent much time together. We helped each other. He will always be in my heart and mind. He was, is a great soul, and he would delight in discussing the syntax of that sentence for hours, <laughs> days, months, years. I'm honored and glad to call him my brother and happy that the last thing I said to him was, I love you. Safe home, Thomas. Truce. Thomas, a bientôt. Je t'aime beaucoup. I'm Sherry Peterson, and I am Tom's niece. And in honor of Tom's love of comfortable clothing, I wore jeans, but I promised to keep my shoes on. <laughs> Tom Rudloff was many things to many people. He was a son, brother, uncle, mentor, helping hand, friend. He was my uncle, but he was also so much more. When I was a little girl, he was the barefooted hippie who hitchhiked through Europe. As a teenager, I saw him as the cool and fun guy who owned what you all know as the antiquarium, but to the family it was simply Tom's bookstore, where I could go and hang out with the world's best cousins and have adventures exploring the store, the downtown area, and the pages of any book you could possibly imagine. Some appropriate for my age, and others that weren't. <laughs> and Mom never did hear about those. <laughs> in my 20s, Tom was the intelligent and worldly business owner who greeted people, often in their native languages, much to their surprise. He reached out to anyone who walked in the door without judgment or fear. It was during these years I learned that the multitudes, multitudes of people sitting around discussing social turmoil in Chile or the reasons behind the declining U.S. dollar were not just Tom's random friends. Some were homeless. Some were just passing through town in need of a place to spread out a blanket and sleep for a night or two or more. Some were doctors. Others were CEOs. But in Tom's bookstore, there were no titles except for those found on the covers of the books. Tom's bookstore was an equalizer. If you loved books, art, good conversation, and bottomless cups of really bad coffee, <laughs> you were not only welcomed, but embraced. Within the family, if you were engaged to a Rudloff, married to a Rudloff, a child of a Rudloff, or just hung out with the Rudloffs, you were Tom's family, instantaneously and without question or doubt. And even though Tom was the only person I ever met in my whole life who could tell me if a relative was a first cousin twice removed or a third cousin once removed, it never really mattered because family was family and the whole big crazy bunch belonged to Tom and he to us. As an adult, Tom became what will always be my favorite role, my friend. Whether discussing literature, art, or just human nature, Tom made the world a little bit more interesting and a lot brighter. I love you, Tom, and I'll miss you for a lot of reasons. 
but mostly because you very often opened my eyes and always opened my heart. We invite anyone who would like to share their memories of Tom to please come forward. We just ask that you be respectful of time so that all who wish to speak may do so. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kenny Carter. Um, and Tom, let's face it, he was kind of a jerk. <laughs> hey, he was nice, he was kind, he was generous to a fault. He set the bar too damn high. <laughs> anyway, Tom had some uh, great sayings. I'm just going to say one of them that I heard him uh, when he was behind the counter. And somebody would say, uh, uh, can I write a check? He says, well, well certainly. And he says, well, do you need some identification? And Tom would say, no, I'm sure you know who you are. <laughs> good morning. No matter what time, good morning. I've adopted it. I'm just going to play a little bit. Um, I like to, sometimes I play for Tom. The only thing I want to say is, and I think at least half of us could, would raise our hand if I were to ask how many people here could, would say that you are who you are due to your knowing Tom. At least, yeah. I was going to do Amazing Grace, but that's been covered. My name is Monica, and I have known Tom, like most of you, since birth. Um, my dad actually worked for him when he was, my dad's first job was working at Tom's, later lived there. So I grew up running around the bookstore like most of you at night. My favorite part was the art gallery. I moved away for a while, was going through some hard times, and one of the things that always got me through, what I looked forward to, was Tom's writing. If anybody's ever gotten a letter from Tom, we all know he writes in calligraphy old English. <laughs> But it was never a simple, hi, how are you, what's going on? It was always a lesson or something. I swear, these were thick envelopes. <laughs> and a teenager. But when I came back to Omaha, one of the first places I went to was Tom's. And then when I had children, I took my son there as well. So three generations of my family have been around Tom. And just like many of you, I've learned so much from him. And I think one of the things that I will take away from knowing Tom was to never give up on learning. We go through life thinking we're done with college, we got our jobs and our careers. One of the things that Tom would always tell me is no matter how far you think you've gone in your education, go further. So all I gotta say is rest in peace, Tom. Hello, uh, my name is Guy Rudloff. I'm uh, Tom's nephew and I, wrote a little something for this paper that I write for once in a while, and I wanted to just read it. Um, and some of these have already been told earlier, but I'm not going to edit it, so we're just going to write straight through. Um, this week, I lost my favorite uncle, and Omaha lost a favorite son. I hope everyone who reads this had a chance, at least at one time, to meet 
Tom Rudloff and wander the fascinating halls, floors of the Antiquarian Bookstore. Very few people in this world are as universally well-liked as Tom was. But then again, very few people were as genuinely kind, funny, and had a, the spirit that Tom had. He started the Antiquarian Bookstore in 1971, located on 12th and Harney. We all know that. Uh, there was an original location, but I could not remember that address. Um, this cavernous old building was home to tens of thousands of used books. Some were worth 10 cents and some were worth thousands of dollars. Tom would probably know a little something about each and every book in his store. He was the smartest man that I had ever known and definitely the kindest. When I was a small boy, my brother and sister and I would spend hours exploring the massive four-level bookstore and it seemed like the biggest place in the world to us when we were growing up. It's, it's there where I learned my love of comic books. Tom would always let me pick out five free comics every time I'd come to visit. Uh, that usually turned into seven or eight. But uh, I still have most of those Marvel masterpieces, and they'd probably be worth quite a bit now, but I, used, I got them to read and not to collect. If I put them in those little, little baggy things, I think they'd be worth more. Um, oh, I'm off script. Okay. Um, um, Tom taught me how to play chess. He was, exactly, it's a good game. Um, Tom taught me how to play chess. He was very patient, and I learned as I learned, and sometimes would uh, actually sort of let me win. Eventually I became pretty proficient, but I never actually remember really beating my uncle. Uh, I remember sitting in the big recliner next to him and being so proud and, and fascinated that he could carry on a conversation with any person from anywhere, from any walk of life, just immediately. It was, it was, it was so impressive to me as a kid watching someone interact like that. Okay, off script, sorry. Um, uh, no matter where, what, what time you arrived, he welcomed you with good morning, would you like a cup of coffee? Um, one of my favorite, uh, you know, he always had so many great expressions. One of my favorites was always, uh, was practical jokes are seldom practical and rarely jocular. <laughs> I remember there was always a stray cat or three wandering around the store. One would often be perched out across his long legs uh, Tom took in stray cats and stray people and treated, and treated them all with dignity and respect. It didn't matter where you came from, if you needed a safe place to hang out for three hours or for three months, he was going to make sure he did everything he could to help you. The Antiquarium was so much more than a bookstore. It was a respected art gallery, became the permanent home to the works of Bill Farmer, and the temporary home to hundreds of other artists over the years. Uh, when, when the late Dave Sink started the record shop in the basement, it became the hangout spot for the cool indie rock local musicians, including Connor Oberst. Um, perhaps most importantly, Tom's gentle spirit and open heart allowed the Antiquarium to become a safe haven for artists and nerds, for sinners and saints, for outcasts and for leaders. During the 40 years of Tom being Tom at the Antiquarium, he was beloved by an eccentric collection of people from all over the country. I miss you, Tom. Thank you for making my life so much better for having known you. I'm Ted Downey. In 1973, I came to Omaha on the hopes of starting a business, and it soon became evident that I wasn't going to be able to afford uh, that business. Uh, a, my, my first experience in, with the Antiquarium was I was working part-time, and somebody, as our assignment was finished, said, let's go have a cup of coffee. I said, I'm so broke I can't afford a cup of coffee. She said, I know where we can have a cup of coffee for nothing. <laughs> And that was where the first time I ran into Tom at the Antiquarium. Uh, subsequently, as time went on and I was taking part, taking of the coffee regularly, uh, it became evident of the uniqueness of his hospitality, and I'd never heard of a person having a customer appreciation party. I don't know how many of you have experienced his annual customer appreciation party. At that time, to sort of repay, I tried to help in the preparations, and 
and was unexpectedly slipped some money that I did not figure that I should get, but he insisted. And since that time, Tom and I have always had a friendship that we felt that uh, we each owed each other more than what we could possibly return. And I think that I got the better of the deal. Thank you. What's up, people? I need to represent. <laughs> you know I need to represent because Tom is not with us, but his spirit is all around us and within each of us. Am I right? Yeah. So, even though there is a heaviness that we no longer have Tom with us, there is the reality that his spirit is now free to flow through all of us. sobriety birthday about two weeks and I just don't think I would have made it with him. I'm just really going to miss him. Jesus. <clears throat> I'm Brian Gennardo. I, uh, I met Tom when I got stuck here. I had some car trouble and, uh, I had, a, I had a lot of trouble. <laughs> we'll call it car trouble. Uh, Tom, anybody remember the dentist chair on the third floor? I called it my bed for a while. I, uh, okay, I gotta make it quick. I could go on forever. I, I knocked the books out of a guy's hands. And I remember I, I came down, I helped him pick him up. I felt so horrible. A lot of books, poetry books, cliff notes, rather. And I, I go downstairs and I sit down and I look over at Tom. He goes, way to go, killer. You just knocked the books out of Bob Dylan's hands. <laughs> he had a familiar face, but I had no idea it was Bob Dylan. <laughs> I came, I came in once from a crying in a champagne minivan. I'd gotten a house out in Millard. It was like a sociology experiment gone horribly wrong. But, <laughs> but I, I was crying because I listened to the second part of an opera. Not really my cup of tea, Southside Chicago, opera. And I, and I went in and I sat down to next to Tom and I said, I just, I, I caught the name, I heard this beautiful opera. It was by, it was an Italian opera. And I had no idea what they were saying. But I, but I felt it. And he said, well, what was the name? I said, it was The Little Prince. Tom said, you've never read The Little Prince. Moito uh, Ubrigado. And Unis uh, Mundus. Uh, 
I was, uh, I was a high schooler in the 80s at Central High, um, and sort of a misfit and a little punk rocker <laughs> in the early 80s, um, you know, around age 14 or 15. And Tom Rudloff and the Antiquarium were uh, a part of my coming of age. Because every day after school, I go straight to the Antiquarium and hang out there, uh, you know, feeling awkward, 14 years old, not knowing who I was or really where I fit in the universe, but that was one place I fit very solidly because Tom was so welcoming and so gracious. And in fact, I was kind of desperately in love with him. <laughs> Those liquid brown eyes and full lips, and I was just kind of like, oh, Tom Rudolph. <laughs> so I would go for my daily fix. Of course, he was gracious and took pity on the 14-year-old girl and, you know, twinkled back a little, nothing inappropriate. Uh, but he was, uh, you know, an absolute fixture in my teenage life, and, and I'll always remember his gracious personality and this environment that um, was like no other. Uh, even the smell of it, when you step in the front door, the smell of old books, uh, will, it's lodged in my head and will be forever. Um, and, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people saying how incredibly welcoming he was and open to anyone who would walk through the door. I remember the one time he turned someone out of the bookstore, um, uh, a rather fringe character who would always wear a yellow hard hat, came into the bookstore one day when I was there with a blowtorch. Uh, and uh, he stood in the center of the little coffee clutch and, and said a few rather uh, disengaged sort of things about the government and, and took out a lighter and... and lit his blowtorch in the middle of the bookstore, <clears throat> and Tom said, it might be a good idea for you to take that outside. So, <laughs> that was really the only time I saw him turn anyone away from <laughs> the antiquarian bookstore. But um, when I heard of Tom's passing, it was uh, you know, very sad for me, uh, particularly in a year when we also uh, lost M's Pub, which to me it was, again, another fixture of, of my teenage life, um, you know, certainly not as significant as the human being that Tom was, but a symbol of, um, of a time, and for me, of my coming of age. So, uh, you know, bon voyage, and love to you, Tom. Thanks. My name's Nicholas Cunningham. Sorry, my phone's going crazy, and I'm just trying to find a note. I've known Tom for a long time, as much as anyone here knows. We had a lot of great times late at night drinking wine, even down in Brownville. I can honestly say I'm a better person for knowing him. One thing uh, we used to talk about, we get on all kinds of subjects, especially after coffee all day and part of the evening and then a bottle of wine at night. But he taught me about uh, Mark Twain's humor. He loved Mark Twain. He loved uh, particularly uh, one piece on, on that Mark Twain had done about the German language. And I thought, it, I, I have that reader now on my toilet and because of him. <laughs> Um, so all I want to say is, Tom, this one's for you. This is the best thing I could think of. Uh, Mark Twain said this, I do not fear death. I had been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. <laughs> so when you're out there in the ether, Tom, you give Al a squeeze for me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Max Montclair. Um, one time when I was in my um, you know, early 20s, I had moved away from Omaha for a while and had come back. Uh, my father, who was often given to going into very loud and um, you know, rants about anything that he could think of, 
um, one day concluded one of his rants with, and when I was working at Mutual, I told Tom Rudloff that. <laughs> and it was kind of like, whoa, uh, you know, this to Ben, like, um, oh, you know Tom? And he's like, yeah, I used to work with him at Mutual when I was a janitor, and he worked uh, documents or something like that. And, yeah, we always talked because uh, he spoke German, and, you know, my father um, had uh, emigrated here from Germany, and it took him until he was about the, the age that I was at that time before he had really mastered English. Um, and I was like, oh. So, you know, and he said, yeah, and then he quit and uh, started a bookstore or something like that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, interesting. And it's like, uh, so, um, um, yeah, as it turned out, that's where I spent most of my teenage years. And my father was completely unaware of this, as, you know, he tended to be. But, um, the, you know, the point is, it, it, you know, it's another illustration of, you know, what uh, Monica said earlier about, you know, he, how he reached out to, you know, multiple generations. And, when I had a son and you know a daughter, you know, bring him back there, and he absolutely adored them. And um, it, so it was, you know, it was, you know, we, it, it's often said that Omaha is like the biggest small town in the United States, and he was one of those, one of those characters who just, you know, kind of made it, you know, the, the uh, a smaller town in the better sense of the word. You know, we, somebody out there knew him or was, you know, at, and um, it, it really did kind of create a connection for a lot of us. And, you know, yeah, someone was saying earlier, you know, about um, how, you know, he could expound on any topic and, and such, and it wasn't showing off. It was a general interest in it. And the thing he really loved was when somebody else had a similar interest or, could either, you know, go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to him or was willing to just, you know, <laughs> repeat, you know, to engage it. And um, so, um, you know, and um, I remember one, one memory I have of, of him is, um, you know, we often talked about various political issues. And shortly after um, the, the, the end of the, um, um, the Iron Curtain and reunification of Germany, um, there was a, uh, a German pun I had heard that I had um, relayed to him and um, thought about it for a minute and then just boomed out in laughter because, yeah. But it, he enjoyed hearing as much from us as we did from him. And it was that kind of back and forth and that really helped build a community. I'm Judy Rudloff. I'm Tom's sister. Many of you know me as Pooh. I have been with Tom here and there in the bookstore, never totally there. But my family and I would like to thank you all so much for coming and for your comments about this, this man who we love so much. Uh, Tommy, goodbye. We love you. My name is Sid Reinhardt, and I'm one of the uh, market rats that basically grew up at the antiquarium. And I think the first time I walked in the door, I was about 12 or 13 years old, and there was a cat named Oops. And I said to Tom, why, why, why do you call him Oops? And Tom says, well, he doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the things I'll always remember is... You know, I was, I was a real smart-ass kid, well, frankly, I'm still a smart-ass adult, but he would, he would say something to me, and three or four days later, I'd realize, wait a minute. <laughs> he, just, he just insulted me and told me what, you know, I was being, being a jerk. Maybe I should learn something from this. But I, I, I worked in the old market for a long time, and I didn't spend a lot of time over at the shop, and then moved to Lincoln. About two, three years ago, I went down to the shop, and I got out of my car and I walked up to the door and he came up to the door and he immediately recognized me and threw his arms up in the air. You know, I am, it was, he's always, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. 
thanks for being a hell of a friend for all those years, and thank you for telling me that I was going to be okay. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, now, if you would like to continue to share stories with each other or with the family, please feel free. Thank you so much. <laughs>